Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh In this series of lectures, I've been uh, speaking about the book Al-Kafi um, In the very beginning, I did I spoke specifically about, about Al-Kafi and its author Al-Kulaini But then for many of these um, intermediary inter, um, uh, uh, lectures, I was speaking about um, kind of a hadith in general um, Kind of where they come from, why they're important, some of the problems that are involved in reading them And some of the benefits that we can derive from studying a hadith I want to once again return to speaking specifically about um, Al-Kafi and, um, and, and Kulaini's work and his, his legacy in general. Um, for today's lecture, I'm going to in large part um, summarize a lot of the ideas that are included in a book by um, one of our contemporary scholars, Sayyid um, Hussein Mudarrasi, um, and his book, Crisis and Consolidation in the Formative Period of Shiite Islam. One of the things that he argues for in this book is that he says that um, uh, Sheikh al Kulaini um, and also the father of Sheikh al Saduq, um, these two personalities, they played a crucial role in um, in helping the Shia community to solidify their beliefs, especially with regards to the the, um, the 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 legitimacy of the position of the twelfth Imam. So let me kind of reconstruct and kind of uh, present his his ideas to you because uh, the conclusion I want to draw at the end I want to give you a sense for what an important role um, Sheikh Al Kulaini played in um, what we now have and what we sometimes take for granted. Let me start by saying this that um, we are extremely blessed to be um, living in a, living in this particular age and not necessarily. At the time when the imams were around, and that sometimes that may seem kind of counterintuitive because we feel like you know, we would love to be with the imams, and of course that would be a blessing in in, in itself. But it was very very challenging, especially towards the um, the times of the later imams, and definitely during the the, the lesser the, the minor occultation. Um, it was an extremely challenging time, um, and there were many people who were were trying to find the truth and were not able to find it. And there are so many you know um, different currents in the community that it was very hard to find the truth. And so right now we're at a very in a, in a very fortunate position where we can look back at history in a, in a, a kind of a, from a, d a distance and with um, you know um, twenty twenty hindsight we can see all of the all of the different developments and and draw our conclusions and have you know all the evidence at our disposal to 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 back up those conclusions. One of the things that we take for granted is that we. Um, we have, of course, our, our belief as as twelve or Shias. We have a belief in these these this twelve the, the twelve imams and um, and the final imam being Imam Al Mahdi, um, may Allah hasten his reappearance. Um, we should realize though that this belief was not always um, clearly understood by the Shia during the times of the imams. Now that's not to say that it wasn't always there, right? Um, the, the, certainly the the beliefs were always there. The the reality, um, the prophecies of these twelve imams to come were always there from the time of the prophet, and and arguably even before our prophet, we have many a hadith that attribute um, the names of the twelve imams, or at least some of them, to even past prophets from the time of um, Prophet Adam, uh, peace be upon them all. Um, so it's one thing to say that the belief was um, was there. It's another thing to say that um, the belief was commonplace. It was not commonplace. It wasn't necessarily known by people that there would be only twelve imams, for instance, or um, what their names were. That wasn't always kind of a, 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 a something that was popularized that, that the Shia were were completely aware of. Um, and and the reason for that is because the. Um, these kinds of things, they were um, even if they were always known to the imams, they weren't always um, able to express all of these things in a, in, a, in a clear and open way. They weren't able to popularize um, certain ideas until until the time was right. Um, what we see is that um, during the time of the eleventh imam, and just at the time when the eleventh imam passed away. Um, there was a, a great amount of confusion and turmoil in the Shia community. Um, people were uh, were there, 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 there. There was a huge difference of opinion because uh, many many of the Shia had not uh, ever seen the twelfth Imam. Most of the Shia had never seen the twelfth Imam, um, and and they began to doubt whether there even was a son for Imam Askari alayhi salam. And so even those who had been um, uh, you know, with Imam al-Askari, they started to doubt. And um, Professor Madarasi um, and, and, and others, they argue that um, a, a majority of the Shia ended up leaving 
the faith and abandoning um, uh, any idea of the of Imam Askari having a son um, because because of this turmoil. And instead, they turned to Imam Askari's brother named Jafar ibn Ali, right, uh, wh whom we now um, refer to as Jafar al kazab and um, the majority of Shia began to follow him um, because he was making a claim um, for being the, the, the imam and successor to his brother. Even, um, even within the family of the, of the Ahlul Bayt themselves, um, uh, there was a difference of opinion. And so we have, for instance, um, Hudayth, who was the 11th imam's mother, and Hakima, who was the 11th imam's aunt. They both supported the, the 12th imam. They, they, they supported the existence of, of a 12th imam who was the son of Imam Askari, alayhi salam. But um, he had a sister, Imam Askari had a sister named Fatima who supported her brother, Ja'far al-Kazab. So even within the family, there was a difference and, and that, that um, kind of radiated out into the community. And like I said, they claimed that um, a majority of the Shia actually abandoned um, faith in the 12th Imam as being the, the son of Imam Askari um, during, during this time. Um, there are a lot of points of confusion. He kind of outlines these points of conf confusion. I'll, I'll list some of them for you that, that um, led people astray and, and uh, led to this, this, this um, situation where people were abandoning the faith. One was that um, they, they knew that an imam, like the, that imam always goes from father to son, never from brother to brother, except for the one, one instance where um, it went from Imam Hassan to Imam Hussein. And there we had you know, special evidence and you know, all of that for, for, for that lateral sort of transference of imama instead of the vertical one. Um, so they were expecting that you know, the 11th imam should have a, 12, a, a, you know, a son who would be the, the next imam. When he didn't have an, a, an apparent heir, I mean, they, they, many of them didn't recognize or didn't know that the, the 12th imam existed, they began to doubt um, w whether even the 11th imam was actually a legitimate imam or not. Because now he's, he's, he's died and he hasn't even left a, a, an heir to continue the, the imam after him. Another point of confusion was that um, the, the people, even the, the, the Shia, they didn't even realize, many of them, um, that there would only be 12 imams. Right? Many of them thought that this was going to be a continuous um, uh, um, a series of events that we'd have a continuous chain of imams all the way until the end of time. And so that, that, that knowledge that there would only be 12 was not something that was commonly, commonly known. Again, that doesn't mean that it wasn't determined or wasn't already prophesied by the pro uh, Prophet earlier on. It simply means that those particular ahadith and teachings of the Prophet had not been popularized and hadn't been kind of um, commonly uh, spread um, in the Shia community. Um, Many of the Shia who had been by the 11th Imam's side, they thought that, okay, even if there's an occultation, even if there's a, a ghaybah, which had been prophesied in some ahadith from before, they thought it would be short. There were, they, they had, um, uh, uh, there, there were some ahadith that were in their hands that said it would be six days or six months or six, six years at most. But when the time of the, the, the occultation of the ghaybah of the Imam exceeded those six years, again, those people started to doubt and, and they started to think that um, you know, maybe we're, 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 we're following the wrong um, the, the wrong thread here. Um, even the concept of the Mahdi, like now we, we, we understand that the Mahdi is the same as the concept of the Qa'im, um, is the same as the concept of the 12th Imam. Like all these, all these terms, they all refer to the same person. We now know that. At that time, that, that wasn't such a clear thing. They knew about the Qa'im. Right, that was something that would have been referred to by by um, uh, the imams before that there would be a a, a person um, who would rise up, who would um, establish God's rule on earth, and you know all of the different prophecies that we have re with regards to the the qa'im. But the word Mahdi, um, again, according to uh, Sayyid Mudarisi, um, was not something that was very um, uh, popular, uh, popularly known amongst the Shia. Ironically, it was the Sunnis. Who had narrated the ahadith regarding the the regarding the, the, the Mahdi um, and his coming and who he would be, the descendant of the Prophet and these sorts of things? Um, they had they had popularized this this um, this idea of the Mahdi much more, even though it, mention of him was there in the uh, Shia ahadith. It wasn't it wasn't uh, popularized um, nearly as much as amongst the Sunnis. Um, one expectation that people had, again, led to confusion, was that the, they expected that the Qa'im, according to some ahadith, that the Qa'im would rise up before his 40th birthday. So even those who had stuck with him past those initial six years, um, once he got to his 40th birthday and he still hadn't um, reappeared and, and made his um, uprising, they began to doubt as well. They, they abandoned him and went, went after other, um, other, other imams. 
Another uh, point of confusion and doubt was that um, many people thought that, okay, well, if the imam is not right making his, his, his um, uh, uprising now, it's because um, it's an oppressive government. It's not, a, it's not a good time. If he rises up, it's going to cause a lot of problems. But then... Um, uh, towards the, the latter part of the, the, the occultation, the, the Ghaybat al um the Shi Shi'i governments came to power under the Buyids. Um, uh, we had a, Sh a Shia government who ruled over Baghdad and some, some, some areas. Um, when that happened, people thought, okay, now he should uh, um, rise up because now we have a Shia government. He can work with them and, and he, can, he can do what he needs to do. There's no reason for him to be in occultation any, any longer. Still, he didn't make his, uh, his rising. And um, and so that that led to further confusion, and and again, so every time one of these things would, would occur, more and more people would leave the faith and abandon uh, abandon the twelfth imam and um, go after either Jafar al-Kadhab or or other other false uh, claimants to the imama. So Sayyid um, Mudarisi makes this claim that um, by the year three twenty or so, if you remember, for context, um, Sheikh al-Kolaini he um, died in three twenty nine. That's when the the Reba, um, the first Reba, um ends and the second Reba starts. So around three twenty, by that time, um, he says a majority of the Shia had abandoned the faith, had abandoned the, the twelfth Imam and gone after other false claimants. Okay, so keep that um, year in perspective and those circumstances. Three twenty, pe most people abandoning the faith. Then we have a census um, of, of sorts taken by Sheikh al-Mufid in the year 373. Right, so about 50 years later. Um, and at that time, he surveys all of the existing Shi'i sects that are, that are there in the Muslim lands. And he doesn't find anyone who's left who still believes that Ja'far al-Kadhab um, was, was, was the imam. They've all, even though a majority of people in th by 320, a majority of people have to, had gone after Ja'far al-Kadhab and abandoned Imam al-Mahdi um, by 370, 53, 50 years later, um, there's no one left who, who, who sticks with that, that belief and everyone has come, or at least the majority have come back and they now believe in, in the 12 Imams um, ending with, with the 12th Imam. So that's the, that's the reality, the historical reality that we see. Now the question is, what, what's the difference? Meaning, what changed people's um, opinions and brought people back to the truth between the year 320 and 373? Uh, Professor Madarisi makes the claim that it is um, in large part due to the work of Sheikh al Kulaini and Sheikh al Saduq's father. That these two individuals, they um, wrote um, critical books at this time that um, helped people to, to refocus, kind of um, uh, reaffirm their belief in the imama and especially the imama of the, the, the 12th imam. Um, Sheikh al Kulani, of course, has his book Al-Kafi, in which he devotes a lot of time to collecting a hadith re with regards to, um, like basically what he's done, he's got, he's, he, he went around in his, in his, um, in his uh, travels and he collected a hadith um, that um, uh, referred to the Mahdi, for instance, that referred to um, um, prophecies of the Prophet and later Imams, that there would be 12, 12 Imams, even the names of the 12 Imams. Like they were there, they had been spoken by previous Imams, but they were hidden here and there and not, not really popularized. What Shaykh al Kulaini and Shaykh Saduq's father did was they collected these and then popularized them. They, they, you know, they, they showed people how many traditions there are from how many different um, chains of, tr of transmitters and um, and, and they, they made it so that people um, now, now you know, knew that, yes, we do have evidence that, that, um, that fits very closely with what we've seen in reality of you know, the, the two different um, occultations of the imam um, uh, and, and, and so forth. Right? Even the name of the imam being the same as the name of the prophet and these sorts of things that we have, we have prophecies for, they popularized the, these ideas. Towards the end of this er, um, section in the book, he, he addresses a couple of um, objections people might um, raise um, for, for we're claiming that all these ahadith were there, but they weren't popularized. He says, well, if they were so, if there were actually so many traditions as we now find in Al Kafi, then um, uh, why was there so much confusion for all of these years? Why were people going after false imams instead of sticking with with the uh, with the imam? So again, the I explained it before, but the the reason why this was the case was that the ahadith were there, but they weren't well known. They weren't popular, and that that's a, not not an unusual circumstance. Um, many times we have a hadith, but we don't necessarily understand what they refer to or how to apply them until something happens, and then all of a sudden that hadith becomes so relevant to us. 
right? Certainly that happened during the Islamic Revolution. Right? All of a sudden, certain ahadith that had prophesied, prophesied kind of certain um, uh, uh, things happening, they were, they were seen um, in reality. And so people started to realize, that, aha, we have, you know, here's the fulfillment of certain, certain um, traditions that we, that, we, that we have from the Ahlul Bayt. Um, another, um, another objection that, that people have raised is that um, some of the, um, the, the Sunni scholars or, or, or um, uh, people who, who weren't Shia, they're the ones who are narrating these ahadith about the Mahdi, for instance. So for instance, Abu Huraira, a, a prominent Sunni um, narrator of traditions, or Abdullah al-Mahd, um, one of the descendants of um, uh, Imam al-Hasan, um, he, he, he also is one of the ones who narrates the, the hadith about um, the, the, the existence of a Mahdi. So these people who are narrating the traditions about uh, the Mahdi, they themselves didn't believe in the same beliefs that we have. So how can we, how can we um, say that they, they um, you know, are, are transmitters of a tradition when they reject the conclusions that we're drawing from those traditions? And the answer he gives is that uh, sometimes people know the truth and it might be right in front of them, but they don't accept it. That's not, that, that doesn't mean that the truth, that um, what they're narrating is not true. It just means that they drew the wrong conclusions from what they had. They had the treasure right in front of them, but they overlooked it. They didn't, they didn't realize, they didn't, they didn't kind of follow it to its logical con conclusion. So that's, that can't be used as, as evidence um, to say that what they were narrating was false and that our claims that the 12th Imam is the, the Mahdi are, are false just because they didn't draw the same conclusions. Towards the end, he has... Um, uh, Sayyid Mudarisi, Professor Mudarisi, he has a couple of um, uh, fr um, paragraphs. I just want to read them to you uh, because he shows, um, in, in, in explicit terms, he, he shows that um, we owe, we have a, um, a, a very great debt that we owe to Shaykh al Kulaini and Shaykh um, al Saduq's father. He says that these hadith that he's been um, talking about, they henceforth became the central point in the Imamate's argument on the occultation and in support of the truth of the Twelver Shiism claim, Twelver Shiism doctrine. They were extremely instrumental in gradually removing the doubts and uncertainties of the Imamite community and persuading the Imamites uh, of the truth of their doctrine. Right, so he's referring to those traditions that Kulaini has, has collected and Sheikh uh, Saluk's father have collected, that these became the central point, the central kind of evidence for the, the imamis, the 12 Rashiris, to now feel reaffirmed in their belief in the 12 imams and in the occultation of the, the 12th imam. This entire success was made possible by the hard work and tireless efforts of the imamite transmitters of hadith during the last decades of the minor occultation up to the middle of the 4th um, at 4th slash 10th century. The, uh, uh, he says, Twelver Shi Shi'i doctrine and the Imamite community owe a great deal to those faithful and courageous men. And here he's referring specifically to those two individuals uh, whom I mentioned, prim prim primary amongst which is um, Sheikh Al-Kulaini. And then in um, one last thing, in one footnote, he, he uh, quotes a hadith from Imam Al-Hadi where the Imam pr predicts um, the existence of people like Shaykh al-Kulaini um, in, in the occultation. So let me read this um, translation of the hadith as well. Um, it's in one of the footnotes in the book. He says, um, it, uh, a statement quoted from Imam al-Hadi reportedly predicted this situation of the existence of these sorts of scholars. It asserts that if it were not for the learned men who exist in the community after the occultation of the Qa'im, which... Uh, which learned men call others to him and instruct people about him, protect the doctrine with the divine proofs, and save the weak among the servants of God uh, from the nets of Satan and his followers and from the traps of the anti-Shiites, nobody would, would remain who had not converted from the religion of God. All right, so Imam al-Hadi is saying, if it weren't for people like Shaykh al-Kulaini, right, he doesn't name him by name, but if it weren't for people like this, then not a single person would remain except that he's uh, converted uh, away from truth and, and gone to follow other, other sects and other religions. Uh, but they, the learned men, will take the reins of the hearts of the weak among the Shia in the same way that the pilot controls the rudder of a ship. Those learned men are the best people before God, the mighty, the exalted. Right, so it's a it's a very um, a kind of clear. Um, uh, we can clearly uh, see the the correlation between that that prophecy of Imam Al Hadi and what um, someone like Sheikh Al Kulaini did. Um, uh, again, I, I don't think we have that kind of perspective or appreciation for for the the turmoil that existed at, at that time and what what a relief a book like um, Al Kafi was for those people 
and, and how much of a debt we owe him for the beliefs that we now have and we kind of com come to so easily um, and have such easy access to. May God have mercy on him and help us to benefit from his book and to really kind of um, um, develop that, that deep appreciation for, for his contribution to our, our faith. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.